Welcome to Aging Insights. I'm Grace Egan, Executive Director of the New Jersey Foundation for Aging. The Foundation's mission is to enable seniors to live with independence and dignity in their communities. We're glad you're joining us for this episode of Aging Insights. Today we're going to talk about the disposal of drugs. More than likely, we all have prescriptions that we've stopped using or medications that have passed their expiration date. Our guests today are Angelo Valenti, Executive Director of the Partnership for, New, for Drug Free New Jersey, and Dr. Sen from Raritan Bay Medical Center, which is part of Meridian Health. I'm very happy you're here today. We always hear that there are proper ways to do things and improper ways. So, so Angela, why don't you tell us what the Partnership for Drug Free New Jersey is about? Sure. Well, thank you, Grace, for allowing mm -hmm. us to be here today. Um, the Partnership for a Drug Free New Jersey was created 25 years ago, mm -hmm. and it was created as a part of the National Partnership for a Drug Free America. And its main goal and mission is to alert the public about the dangers of substance abuse. And in, over the years, we've seen many trends that have mm -hmm. really impacted our state. Uh, over the last few years, we, prescription drugs have become really our number one issue that we're dealing with. And that's why this show is so important, talking about the fact that there are so many of these prescription drugs that are sitting in everyone's homes. Mm -hmm. And really, we have to realize that the reason why we're so involved in this issue is that 70% of people who are in rehabilitation centers as a result of their addiction to prescription drugs they said that they got those drugs, they accessed those drugs through the medicine cabinets of family and friends. Mm -hmm. So, Not through their doctor. No, no well, it, it, in many cases, mm -hmm. the prescriptions obviously came from a, prescri a prescribed right. medicines from their doctors. But so many young people were uh, experimenting with these prescription drugs because they felt that they were safe. Uh, since they were prescribed by a doctor, since they were being taken by their grandparents or parents, mm -hmm. I mean, how dangerous could it be? And we've learned that in many cases, especially when you're dealing with the opiates, that they can become extremely addictive. And uh, that's why this, this, this effort is so important. First and foremost, to alert people about this addiction that exists and this epidemic. We're at epidemic levels in New Jersey and throughout the country. But secondly, to be able to tell them that they, there's things that they can do to help uh, prevent this particular uh, substance abuse issue mm -hmm. from happening in their families. And one of the ways is to be able to eliminate, to, uh, to dispose of safely the medicines that you have in your medicine cabinet that you no longer need or want. Yeah, I appreciate you mentioning that. Your name implies you have a lot of partners. So who would that include? Well, we work with uh, government. Okay. Uh, we work with the, the nonprofit sector, uh, other folks that are involved in, in prevention and treatment. Uh, we work with the media because it's crucial for us to get the messages out. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of partners in the media. And over the last uh, several years dealing with this issue of prescription drugs, we've also worked very closely with the medical community uh, because they, we believe that they are really a great partner in, in helping to uh, identify the issue uh, in their patients, mm -hmm. uh, being able to safely prescribe when necessary, but also being able to share information right. to their patients about the dangers of these drugs. I noticed on your website that you talk about the American Medicine Chess Challenge. Yes. Can you explain what that is? Sure. Uh, the American Medicine Chess Challenge was actually created in New Jersey as a national oh, initiative. Really? Oh. And what we found was that uh, several years ago, uh, prior to the uh, Federal uh, Drug Enforcement Administration being involved in this issue, uh, there was really very few opportunities for residents of New Jersey and residents throughout the country to safely dispose of their medicine. Hmm. It was very confusing. Uh, the guidelines, if you looked online, were uh, really you had to have a law degree to be able to figure out you know, what you could or could not dispose and how you could dispose of those medicines. So what we did in New Jersey is we worked with our local Drug Enforcement Administration okay. and we established a first ever Take Back Day. And that was a partnership between law enforcement and the Partnership for Drug Free New Jersey. And what we did is we worked so that all of the communities throughout the state would have an opportunity to go to their local either a police department or sheriff's office or New Jersey State Police as well were involved. Mm -hmm. And what they were able to do during a certain period of time was to bring their unused and expired medicines to the police department and then they would be safely disposed of through incineration, which is a very uh, 
both cost-effective way and also it's a great way from an environmental perspective to be able to dispose of these medicines safely. Mm -hmm. And the event was very successful. New Jersey uh, was the first. New Jersey, we were the first state mm -hmm. in the nation to have this event. And it really became the model for the rest of the country. So as a result of the success we had, the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy featured mm -hmm. this particular event uh, back in uh, 2010 as a model project. And we received calls as a result of that from folks throughout the country that wanted to replicate what we had done in New Jersey. So what we did is we created the American Medicine Chess Challenge right here in the state to be able to really make it a turnkey process for other states, other communities mm -hmm. to be able to, to replicate. Now that has evolved quickly. I'm sure. And, and what we've seen, what we're seeing now is that in many communities, not only do they have the temporary day, which you'll have usually in the fall or the mm -hmm. spring, but you also have permanent collection boxes, which are boxes that are located at police departments where you can go anytime to dispose of your medicine. And that's particularly important in end of life situations where mm -hmm. you have family members that might walk into a home and it would be you know, numerous prescriptions, most of which would be opiates. Mm -hmm. And it's important to be able to know where you can dispose of that medicine safely. Sure. And uh, so what we do with the American Medicine Chest Challenge is we have a directory which you can either visit our website, which is the American, um, AmericanMedicineChest.com, or we even have an app, a free app, an app. where you can download to your mm -hmm. phone. Mm -hmm. And if you put your zip code in, mm -hmm. it will tell you within a five mile or 10 mile mm -hmm. radius, which police departments are participating on a permanent basis. Now, is this just a New Jersey um, directory? No, it's a national directory. It's a national directory. directory. Yes. Uh, we have about 240 locations in the state of New Jersey. That's great. Uh, police departments. But there are close to 2,000 locations in 47 states mm -hmm. that are registered with the American Medicine Chest Challenge. Well, I think that's important to know. People travel. Yes. People have other family members in other states. People are distant caregivers. So it's nice to know yes. that they can find um, such a important resource. Yes, so and it's all great. free of charge and there's no questions asked. Mm -hmm. So when you do go to the local police department, you could bring your medicines in a plastic bag mm -hmm. or in, in, if you do keep them in your prescription bottles and you want to dispose of them, right. it's important to make sure that you cross out any information. So there's confidentiality. So any names or prescription doctor's names mm -hmm. on those bottles should be blacked out in marker or whatever. Right, in marker. <laughs> or I guess you can, sometimes you can pull out the labels, but they're pretty yes. tight. Yeah. <laughs> they're pretty tight. So um, we understand there's a five-step American Medicine Chest Challenge. Yes. Is that different yes. than what you well, just described? It's part of that effort okay. um, because not everybody has medicines that they need to dispose of, but those folks are just as uh, that their families can, can access those medicines as quickly as those who have medicines that are not being used. So if you have medicines okay. in your medicine cabinet that you use on a regular basis, uh, they're th the same kind of concern. Uh, should be shared for those individuals as well. Do we want to give an example? I'm just sure. curious. Well, you might have an individual that might be on a pain medication for okay. a, a post-operative care, mm -hmm. and they, they have a 60 or 90 day supply. And they're gonna be okay. using that medication for 60 or 90 days. So when we talk about disposing of those medicines, they might not be interested because they know that they're gonna be using those medicines Correct. and it's not gonna affect them. But those same medicines could easily be accessed in their medicine cabinet by grandchildren, oh, sure. by folks okay. visiting. Mm -hmm. So it's not only people who have to dispose of their medicines, but pe anyone who has medicines in their medicine cabinet. If they take these five steps, one of which was, is, is disposal, okay. but the other steps are just as important. First and foremost, you have to know what's in your medicine cabinet. True. Do an inventory. I mean, so many of us, before I was so involved in this program, mm -hmm. when I went the, during the first take back day, and I looked at our medicine cabinet. I couldn't believe mm -hmm. there were medicines that were sitting there for five, ten years mm -hmm. that we might have taken one or two after a dental procedure, right. and then you just it just sat there. So that's the kind of medicine that becomes very uh, concerning uh, for access by children, by mm -hmm. by other even adults that are that mm -hmm. have an addiction problem. Uh, the second step is to make sure you keep your medicines in a safe place. Now this is contrary in many ways to what we've heard for many years. Oh, not on the side of your bed? Uh, well, we, we've or... heard putting it in the kitchen so you don't forget okay, to take exactly, it. Exactly, that's what I mean. Uh, right. You know, making it visible. Mm -hmm. And it's important to remember to take your medicines because medicines play an important mm -hmm. role in keeping our, our folks uh, healthy and uh, living active lifestyles. But 
we've seen a change in that process. Now we're asking people to keep them in a safe place, out of the reach of children, out of the reach of folks visiting, out mm -hmm. of the reach of a, a, a worker that might be coming to your house right. to fix a, a leaky pipe. Mm -hmm. Because those are the kind of uh, individuals that might wind up in your medicine cabinet if they have an addiction uh, issue, issue with, with, right. with opiates. So, so it's important to keep them in a safe place. The third step is to make sure that you uh, don't share your medicines. Medicines are prescribed, and the doctor will talk about it a little later, with an with a, a understanding of a patient's uh, physical and mental right. uh, uh, care. Yeah. So, so it's important that that, that medicine is not shared, mm -hmm. because a medicine that might be prescribed for one person might not be prescribed for another person right. based on other circumstances. And the fifth step, which is most important, is to speak to your children about this issue. Let them know that these are very dangerous, uh, to experiment with these kind of mm -hmm. medicines that, that while they have a very important role, uh, they also can be addictive. Right. And we, we need to understand that. I guess we also have to understand, besides addiction, that there's a street value for oh. some of these drugs, which so it may not be somebody using them, but taking them to the next level of distributing to someone else who yeah, might use them. There is definitely an illicit market that yeah, exists in the so. state and unfortunately we see this uh, in all communities and that's mm -hmm. very important. Mm -hmm. uh, for many years there was, especially when you're dealing with prescription drugs and heroin abuse, there might have been a uh, misperception about this drug being an urban drug mm. uh, that you know you hear about the the addicted individual and you think about it you know the Bowery for many years that was a place mm -hmm. where the there was a congregation of, of mm -hmm. folks that unfortunately had this disease but now what we're seeing is, is that these addictions are in each of our communities, mm -hmm. our suburban communities, our rural communities, right. our wealthy communities, and our poor communities. So there's not a family in the state that doesn't need to be aware of this sure. issue. Sure. Um, so since we really want to talk about the best ways people can dispose sure. of, of um, their drugs, and you know, people used to, or maybe they still do, uh, think they can flush. So right. there's some problems with that, right? Well, what we suggest is that there's many other alternatives okay. that are safe and that we believe are much more environmentally uh, pleasable uh, at this point. Okay. Uh, one, in, and first and foremost, we recommend if you have an opportunity to go to a local police department uh, that is one of participating the in exactly New in New Jersey, I is to take advantage of that. Okay. Uh, and then, if you can't, if your community doesn't have one, then the, in, in most cases, those other communities throughout the state will have a collection day right. that takes place usually in the fall and the spring. Uh, the American Medicine Chest Challenge has a collection day in November each of each year, the mm -hmm. second Saturday in November throughout the country, which includes the New Jersey communities. But if you can't get to a collection site for, for any reason, uh, there are some other safe ways to dispose of your medicines. The recommendation is that you take those medicines and you put them in a plastic bag and you dilute it with water. And then the next... This for capsules, for tabs, for any, uh, any type of... Any medicine whatsoever any medicine. can go okay. in that plastic bag. Okay. And then what you want to do is, uh, for safety purposes, you want to be able to mix that with coffee grinds or with cat litter and then it becomes a solid, and then you can, you can toss that plastic bag into your garbage. So it's a, a couple of steps, very simple, mm -hmm. but it's a safe way to dispose of your medicines from the home as well. Well, I think that's an, um, a good suggestion. Yes. And um, coffee grinds or kitty litter exactly. or something like that. That's, that. that's very interesting. And then you just seal the bag and throw it in your garbage. Absolutely, yes. Is this true for most drugs, all drugs? Um, we, I don't think there's any distinction between the drugs that no. can be disposed in that, in that respect. So anybody who has any drugs whatsoever can mm -hmm. take that process and, and be able to safely dispose of their medicines from their homes as well. Well, it's good to know they're not different protocols. It would make, right. make it probably more difficult yes. for people. And um, our seniors who are, I think you've already addressed this, but I wanted to just go back to it again, are seniors that are not doing this putting themselves at risk? Well, we think that they're putting themselves at risk, but, but more importantly, they might be putting their grandchildren at risk okay. uh, they, for those that might be experimenting. Mm -hmm. uh, they might be putting uh, individuals that are visiting them mm -hmm. who m might have either an addiction uh, disease that, that requires mm -hmm. them to be able to get access to these drugs, or they might be taking the drugs, as you mentioned, and, and selling those drugs. So I think that, you know, generally, it's a, it's for seniors that have these medications in their homes, and we know that most seniors have a certain number of medications in, in their homes. Uh, I know research has shown that 
you know, when a person reaches a certain age, yeah. uh, there's the, anywhere between three and five medicines that they are taking right. at any given time. Right. So we think, we think it's crucial for them to help protect themselves and their families mm -hmm. uh, to be able to take these steps. Well, I think it's um, good that, to tell someone how they can do it themselves in an uh, easy way. Yes. Um, I, now, Dr. Sen, I know you and I have spoken off camera about right. um, pain relief when people are having surgery. I mean, opiates seem to be the most frequently prescribed right. um, medication after knee or hip or mm -hmm. surgery or whatever, the pain management for rehab. Um, but often I hear patients who don't want to take those medicines for a variety of reasons. So how does, shall I say, not um, electing some pain medication affect their rehab or doesn't it? Well, rehabilitation is, is a very uh, comprehensive concept. Okay. It's a very big concept. And taking away the pain is one component, mm -hmm. uh, which is not to disregard uh, pain. But pain needs to be approached both objectively as well as subjectively. So pain relief comes through the body. Pain relief also comes through the pain. Now, we have to understand one uh, fundamental concept about rehabilitation. Rehab will take care of the immediate um, problems. It gives an immediate relief and a benefit. But rehab is also about giving a long-term benefit. Re, um, uh, the rehabilitation process. Right, I was going process. to say building back that strength that you have. Building had back the strength. Okay. So it, it has to be a marriage between the immediate effects as mm -hmm. also the long-term uh, benefits. Mm -hmm. So in the concept of pain relief, it does not really make any sense in giving a pain medication which can take off the pain but at the same time, in the long term, it can introduce addiction, it can give a whole lot of adverse effects. Now, coming back to drugs, mm -hmm. any drug would have its own adverse effects, right? And if you use it for a chronic period of time, you're going to have its adverse effects. If you overdose it, you're going to have its adverse effects. Sure. So no drug is an angel in the sky. But when it comes to this class of medication, Opiates. Opiates. Mm -hmm. It is beyond this drug because mm -hmm. it is about addiction, it is about tolerance, mm -hmm. which kind of piles up. So to that end, uh, when we look into this epidemic that we are having here, I call it an endemic also because it has become a culture, I would welcome this apprehension. The I would, fear. The fear, fear. that we have. I, I would call it a very necessary awareness mm -hmm. that this is a medication which can take off the pain, but this is a medication whose consequences mm -hmm are far more adverse than what we can imagine. So before we go further, can you list the common opiates? We talked a little bit, because sometimes people don't realize that they're taking an opiate. This was prescribed to me, it's Percocet. Is it a problem? So what are some common um, brand or generic? Uh, the the adverse effects of, of... No, the names of the actual drugs. Well, Oxycontin is one of them. Oxycontin, uh, okay. Percocet is another one. Uh, Vicoset is another one, Vicodin we use it. So it comes in different brand names. Okay. And, uh, and again, the adverse effects are, are very strong. Um, sure, that people don't want to be foggy because they think it's going to make them foggy or it's, and there, so there are a lot of other um, side effects. So what well, that's, that's yes, being, feeling foggy is only the tip of an iceberg. Tip of the iceberg, I'm, I'm, okay. Uh, there's something which is called as respiratory depression. Okay, it so depresses our respiration. And uh, I would like to add one point here. Uh, there's a disease that is very common, much more common than we think, and it's, it goes vastly underdiagnosed. It's called sleep apnea. Oh. Now, in sleep really? apnea, hmm. um, you know, the brain does not give the right signals for the lungs to breathe. So we have episodes of oh. no breathing. We call it apnea. Mm -hmm. So anyone who is, on, who is with sleep apnea and is on these medications, you're looking at a disaster that's waiting to happen. Hmm. Because one of the most prominent adverse effects of this class of drugs, opiates, is respiratory depression. That's one. Okay. The other one is constipation. Okay. By nature, this class of medication decreases what we call the peristaltic movement of mm -hmm. the gut. Mm -hmm. I have had patients who have come to us with a bowel obstruction. So in other words, he started out with a constipation, they wanted to get rid of it, they took another set of medications, and it didn't work because they continued to take this class of medications and ended up with a surgical emergency. Right, so, um, so they have a bowel obstruction, which is a side effect of, well, constipation that's built on with a bowel obstruction because of the side effects of the opiates. Absolutely. Okay, and you know, now, now you even see advertisements for those on 
TV, which mm -hmm. is not not how to get a bowel obstruction, but how to take a medication to deal with it. So I'm just curious. So um, I just want to go back for a second because, I, as I said, I think people don't necessarily understand their medications are opiates. Mm -hmm. Tramadol, is that, is that mm -hmm. one? A Oxycontin that you talked mm -hmm. about. Percocet. Mm -hmm. um, Vicodin. Vicodin. Mm -hmm. um, Ultraset. OK. okay. And um, OK. So I just want people to be able to say, oh, I am. Yeah, now I recognize an issue that I might have. Okay, all right. So, um, are there alternatives in t re regarding pain modification that would help someone sidestep using an opiate? Absolutely, there are plenty of them. Uh, first of all, we have medications which are non-opiates. They they are strong, good analgesics. They work just analgesics. as good analgesics. Okay. They mm -hmm. work just as good as these class of medications without the adverse effects. Uh, acetaminophen is one of them. Acetaminophen, yes. okay. Uh, they, they work very well. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, they also do a good job. We were talking about Motrin, Motrin. before that. They also do a good job. Uh, we have to realize that uh, 80 to 90 percent of the global consumption of opiates uh, takes place in this country. In the U.S. In the U.S. So there is something fundamentally wrong that we are doing when we approach uh, this pain, uh, this concept of pain. And besides the pain, uh, medications mm -hmm. that we have, there are other ways that we can approach pain relief. One of them is CBT, what we call as the cognitive behavioral therapy. Cognitive, the kind of cognitive behavioral therapy. Okay. They kind of tutor the mind to, uh, to control their own bodily pain. Now these are very okay. well structured, well focused, uh, well directed uh, therapy sessions. They work very well. So with that, you would need the, the help of a therapist, mm -hmm. presumably, and it would take, I would imagine, a couple of sessions to A couple of sessions. To, but it would be also, um, we talk about uh, long-term effects. Presumably, it would help you in other instances, too. Uh, absolutely. So, okay. And with it comes the obvious benefit that they don't have an adverse effect. Of uh, the opiates. Of opiates. Mm -hmm. and, and then, uh, which comes very close to the CBT, is meditation, and there have been tons of literature coming out from uh, evidence-based trials and research that has been done in prestigious Ivy League universities here, which has shown that meditation plays a big role mm -hmm. in, in uh, you know, reducing this, uh, the feeling of pain. So there's no point in keeping them as uh, intellectual treasures. I was going to say uh, secrets. Yes, secrets, and, and, <laughs> and not use it right. uh, when the situation comes in pragmatic situations. So we've got to bring those concepts here mm -hmm. and, and utilize them. And how do we do that? Well, I think this we've got to change the mindset. Of? Of physicians. And you know, patients. And patients. Mm -hmm. uh, we, you know, each of them, they need to be convinced that mm -hmm. these other avenues are just as good, if not better, mm -hmm. than, and, uh, than these medications. We have a dependency on medications. That, that needs to be addressed very right. seriously. Right. But, and, but compliance with those medications is important. Is equally important, yes, right. so absolutely. Whether it's limiting it or whether it's using it as needed, I mean, I don't know. I think another issue which is crucial mm -hmm. is the long-term mm -hmm. use of opiates. And I think the doctor might be able mm -hmm. to share how that whole uh, community, uh, the medical community, mm -hmm. is changing their position. Because for many years, people mm -hmm. were kept on opiates for extended periods of times, mm -hmm. three, five, ten years. Right. And there is a point where the opiates can only provide so much relief. Oh, so you have uh, to build... Uh, you build up, but also it, 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 there is a point where it turns from, from a relief of pain to an addiction. And that happens all too often in patients that are on long-term opiate use. So I think that's no, another... That, that's that, a perfect point raised. What we call as tolerance. Tolerance. Opiates have tremendous amount of tolerance problem. You start off with one medication, they give the desired effect, then, you know, one week down the road, two weeks down the road, you will need about two to three of them for the mm -hmm. same desired effect. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, you develop this addiction. Mm -hmm. So going back to, shall I say, advocating for a new perspective, mm -hmm. I know you train new doctors. Right. So um, is compliance, proper drug disposal, and alternatives something that you're able to cover in that training? Absolutely. There are two venues where uh, mm -hmm. it provides us with a great opportunity to train our residents. One is the post-op when the surgery has done been done just been mm -hmm. done the patient gets downgraded to the floor so there is an opportunity to train the residents to apprise the patients that you know you've been on morphine 
justifiably because of the acute pain, mm -hmm. now you're going to go home, but these are medications that A, if it needs to be taken, it needs to be taken for a very short period of time because of okay. its adverse effects mm -hmm. and the, its capability to introduce addiction, as well to the fact that there are other alternatives which are just as good. And you teach the residents how to speak to patients? Absolutely. It's one of the core competencies. You know, in residency okay. across the board in this country, we have six competencies, you know, patient care, medical knowledge, patient-based learning. So one of them is professionalism and, and communication. So this, these are very sensitive uh, situations. Mm -hmm. We actually train them to take their time, sit with the patients, reach out to the patients' problems, and give them the viable alternatives. Mm -hmm. And what about our current core of physicians? Mm. Well, there's a very interesting uh, bill that's in Trenton mm -hmm. Uh, that both the doctor okay. and I have at, uh, had an opportunity to speak uh, mm -hmm. to the legislators about. And this bill would require that physicians prior to prescribing an opiate uh, be mandated to have a discussion with the patient, or if it's a minor with their, mm -hmm. with their parents, uh, and also discuss the alternatives that the doctor was speaking of. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is really a very innovative approach. Mm -hmm. uh, we're very pleased with the support we, we have received. It, that bill passed the Senate almost unanimously mm -hmm. in New Jersey, and now we're waiting for it to be voted upon in the Assembly and, and then signed into law. But that bill would be a, setting a gold standard in, in, in New Jersey for having this conversation between a patient and a, a doctor about the the concerns and mm -hmm. dangers that may potentially exist with the prescribing of an opiate right. and also what alternatives might be available. Mm -hmm. And does this enable um, um, continuing education for those physicians that we currently have? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. One of them is, you know, every institution, they have an approach to continue these medications. You mean we hospital have, practice, absolutely. medical practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have uh, seminars, we have workshops, we have grand rounds, and we actually invite an Angela to speak yes. to us. And you know, the knowledge gets um, you know distributed to the other mm -hmm. medical staff. But I also think this is such a global and national problem. It has to come from all corners. It has to come sure. from us physicians, from hospitals, great organizations like this one, from the media, mm -hmm. uh, from foundations, from legislation. Mm -hmm. So all of us, we need to shake hands and put an end to this epidemic. But we do think that there's no question that there needs to be some sort of standards for continuing right. medical education requirements right. mm -hmm. uh, for all doctors that are prescribing opiates, which we are also working with the legislators in New Jersey to be able to establish. Mm -hmm. So that's another very mm -hmm. important aspect, as the doctor had mm -hmm. mentioned, is that continuing uh, education on the part of the physicians right. about this issue. Because for many years, I think physicians were led down a path of believing mm -hmm. that opiates were a uh, quick fix right. and mm -hmm. that there were very right. little negative aspects right. to it. Mm -hmm. So it's good to know there are, are alternatives and that, in fact, if you have these in your home, that you can figure out the best way to dispose of them. Yes. Right. So I'd like to thank you both for sharing your time with us today. Um, it's a very important topic. Aging Insights is produced by the New Jersey Foundation for Aging and is made possible by donations to the foundation. To become a sponsor for Aging Insights, please go to our website at www.njfoundationforaging.org, or you can call our office, which might be easier, at 609-421-0206. All of the previous shows that we've done um, ha can be viewed on our website. We want to remind you to find out about senior services in your area. Please contact the county offices on aging. And you will see their numbers on our website, and you may go to the state hotline at 1-877-222-3737. And I think we'll put your number on our website, too, so they can Excellent. find out about disposal. Sure. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Aging Insights. And remember, aging is everyone's business.